Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And uh, we'll, we'll get through, his, I don't think we're going to get through all of Hebrews chapter 12, obviously. But remember, um, we saw, we looked at last week, the hall of faith. Remember, chapter 11, faith. Chapter 12, hope. Chapter 13, love. And we looked at the hall of faith, and, and we, we talked about these different, in, in, these different individuals. We talked about Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Samson, Barak, all of these people that God used to do great things and mighty things in their lives. Now, and when we got to the end of chapter 12, remember you talked about sometimes God did a miraculous thing and he would deliver some people and like, do wonders, and sometimes people died by the end of the sword. Sometimes, like Isaiah, he was sawn in half, he was sawn asunder. But the point of, the, of chapter 11 is this, that they all had faith. They all had trust, they all had hope, and they were living for something else, for something bigger than this earthly kingdom in this earth. They were living for something more. Remember, Abraham went out looking for a city whose maker and builder was God. And the point of Hebrews chapter 11, remember, in the context was to encourage the Jewish believers that were on the fence to going back and falling away from Jesus Christ. It was to encourage them. And obviously, he uses all the Old Testament examples to say, look it, these were people that you know about, that you studied about as a child, that you understand about. Their lives weren't easy. It was difficult. It was hard, just like your life is right now. And his point in writing to them was have faith, hang on to Christ, go on to maturity in Christ, don't fall away, don't fall back. And remember, as we went through the book of Hebrews, we saw that sometimes when people that fell away, he said they might not have really knew the Lord. We don't know that. God sorts all that out, all that out in the end. But the point of chapter 11 is faith. Have faith in God. Move on. Go on to maturity in Jesus Christ. And God speaks the same thing to us today. Where is our faith? What do we really believe in? Have we come to a place in our lives that we know, that we know, that we know that this book is the truth. It's the word of God. We've tested it. We've tried it. We know that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We know that Jesus is coming again. We know that Jesus died and rose again. We know that. Or do we still have a said faith? You know, we say we believe those things. But we really never walked in that faith. We really never stepped out by faith. We've really never seen God come through in our lives. We really never, you know, when the persecutions and the hard times came, we really never stuck it out and let the Lord do what he wanted to do in our life because that's what chapter 12 is going to be about as we start to go through it. And he's writing chapter 12 to them as hope to encourage them. When you're going through the difficulties, hang on because God has a plan. And then he says, those of you who don't hang on, you, know, you might not be part of the camp. Look in verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What cloud of witnesses? Who's he talking about? He's talking about all the people he mentioned in chapter 11. Noah, Moses, Abraham, Abel, Deborah, Barak, Isaiah. He doesn't mention his name, but he says saints were sawn asunder. That's referring to Isaiah. Okay? He says, we have this cloud of witnesses. Now, where's the cloud of witnesses? Where's the cloud of witnesses? He's saying that these are the ones who have gone before us, and they make up the cloud of witnesses in heaven. They're a witness to, to having great faith. This is what they've done, and we have a great cloud of witnesses, he says. He says, we are foreseeing, we also are compassed about, they're around us, they're about us with so great a cloud of witnesses. He's saying that these people have went before us. They've walked by faith. They've been through the, tri the, the trials. Some of them, God delivered with great miracles. Some of them were not delivered. But his whole point is they've been through it, they went through it. Now they're in that new Jerusalem that he's going to talk about in chapter 12. Now they're with the Lord. Now they're with God, they're in that place, they're in that city that I believe literally comes down from heaven. If you read the end of Revelation and heaven meets earth at that time, at the end. He says, there, there, they went before us. And he's saying, because they went before us and they walked by faith, we can be just like them. That's his point. See, I believe that the same God that they served, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
the other Old Testament saints, is the same God we serve today. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be doing this. Very simple. And not only that, I believe that the same God that did great works in their life can do the same things in my life and in your life. And that's his whole point here. He goes, this is the hope you need to have. He's writing to a persecuted church. He's writing to Jewish believers that are on the fence, that they're afraid to be uh, uh, being exiled from their families and put out, some of them possibly martyred. And he's writing to them saying that, let me give you all these examples in the Old Testament from the scriptures you know of people that God blessed and delivered and had faith and trust. He's saying the same thing for them, and I'm saying the same thing for us. That we need to have that kind of faith. When we die, we make up this cloud of witnesses. We go and be with them. We come to the end just like they did. You know what? The end's just the beginning and we're finally with the Lord. Because we're what? We learned about last week with Abraham. He was a pilgrim. He was a sojourner. He wasn't a vagabond. A vagabond is somebody who just takes up shop wherever. Lives off the land of whoever he can. Abraham was a pilgrim. He was a sojourner. I mean, he was looking for something. There was a purpose to his life. And the purpose was to dwell and be with God. That's our purpose. We're not vagabonds. We're pilgrims. We're sojourners. Do we have that kind of hope? Do we have that kind of faith? And he goes, there's a cloud of witnesses that has already gone before us. He goes, take them as your example. Use them for your example. Basically what he's saying. He's saying if God did it in their life, he's going to do it in your life. So don't fall back. Don't fall away. If God did it in Noah's life, he's going to do it in your life. If God did it in Moses' life, he's going to do it in your life. He did it in Abel's life, he's going to do it in your life. That's what he's saying. He goes, we have a great cloud of witnesses that have already gone before that are with the Lord now. And he goes, since we have this great cloud of witnesses and they've gone before, they've walked through the trials, they walked through the battles. Look what he says now. Exhortation here. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us and let us run the race or let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus. Now listen. Let us, let us, and looking. So since we have a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before, since the same God that is their God is our God, What are we going to do about it? What's going to hold us back from God getting the most glory out of our lives? Look what he says. He says some of us have weights. Let us lay aside every weight. Every weight. You ever see like the old movies with the guy that went to jail and he's got the ball and the chain. It's to slow him down so he can't run away. Right? Very simple. Okay? The point here is the opposite for us. God wants us to move swiftly for the kingdom. He wants us to move quick. He wants us to do things for his glory. But some of us have weights that are holding us down, holding us down. Some of it is a lack of faith and trust. He says it's sin which so easily besets us, holds us down from God doing greater things in our lives. Right? Because if you don't know this, right, in the end, God's going to win in your life. You can fight against them. You can toil. You can say, God, I don't want to do that. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. You can do that. You can make your life miserable all you want. You can do that. But in the end, he's going to win. And he promises so much that he's going to win that if you continually sin and it's a sin unto death, he'll take you out because he's going to win because his glory depends on it. But God wants to do great works in our lives. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what do we need to lay aside? What is holding us back from doing, from doing more for the kingdom, from living more for Jesus Christ? What's holding us down? What's stopping our faith? For this early church, it was persecution. I, I don't want to go on to full faith in Jesus because I'll be put out. A lot of us don't face that. Some of us do right? But what's holding us down? He goes, it's sin that so easily besets us, 
holds us back and holds us down. You know, you ever try to go to the Lord, you go to the Lord in your prayer life, and you're talking to God, and you're asking God for things, and you're asking for strength, you're asking Him to get through the day, and then there's just one thing that continually comes to the back of your mind. Whatever, you got into a fight with your wife last night, and you acted, you know, like you usually act, or whatever you do. And that's coming there, and God says, well, I, I want to do these things, I want to, you know, I want to be, speak more clearly with you, but you need to let this, leave this beside. You need to let this go. You need to offer it up. You need to go make it right. The sin that so easily besets us, gossip, bitterness, envy, all of those things, they so what? It says easily beset us. The little things that trip us up, that we don't want to walk by faith in. He says those things are like weights holding us down. Weights holding us down. Listen, I, we, we talk to people sometimes, we counsel them, we tell them, this is what the Bible says, do it. And they say, wait a minute, but if I do that, you know what, you know, I, I might lose my, my, my low-income housing, I, I might lose this, I might lose that. I said, yeah, but, you know, you're cutting corners in certain areas. You don't think it's holding you down, but from God's perspective, it's holding you down. And whatever their situation is, you know. But if I do that, I, something will happen. This will happen. Well, the Bible says it's holding you down. It's a weight. See, we can't see the weight. We don't understand it sometimes. We don't think it's holding us down. We think the sin's blessing us sometimes. But the Bible says it's holding us down. It's holding us back from what God really has for us. Oh, you know what? If I go home and tell my wife I'm sorry, you know, then she'll manipulate me. And she'll, be, you know, she'll start to rule over me and all this stuff or vice versa. If I go home and tell my husband I'm sorry, you know, then this will happen. He'll, he'll take advantage of me. Well, the Bible says that's holding you down. That's a weight. But I can't do that. I can't do it God, God's way. It's too hard. There's no way. No way. Th things won't work out for me. Wait a minute. It's a weight. Let go of the weight. Because it so easily besets you. Look what he says. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us very simple if you have a weight that's holding you back you can't run right you can't run listen you know i got hurt i hurt my calf here because i was playing you know basketball i didn't stretch out and i was wearing work boots and all that stuff see i i used to wear work boots when i was younger when i played basketball because they held you down you know i was 19 20 we used to play basketball all night long and then when I took the work boots off and I put the sneakers on, it was like I could fly. I was jumping higher and all that stuff, running faster. But I still think I could wear the work boots when I'm 39 years old. So I tore my whole calf muscle and everything else and I learned the hard way. Because I was hoping, you know, I'm going to get back to that, you know, 20, 22-year-old form. I'll be able to hang on the rim and all this stuff and yada, da, yada, da. But the work boots were a weight. And I didn't stretch out properly, so I hurt myself. Very simple. Same thing in life. God wants you to run the race. And if things that are holding you back and slowing you down, right, and the sin that's slowing you down, you can't run the race, you walk the race, and you jog the race. God wants you to run, run the race for Jesus Christ. And I don't know what's going on in your life. God knows what's going on in your life. Some of us battle with finances. Some of us battle in relationships. Some of us just battle. Some of us are lazy. Some of us don't want to get involved in ministry because we're too proud. We don't want to do certain things. No one's going to tell me what to do. All this stuff. Some of us don't get promotions at work that God has for us because you know what? We won't just do what we're told from the boss or whatever. It's a weight. The Bible says run the race without dragging weights behind you. It's holding you back. Now watch what he says. How do we run it? Leave the stuff behind. It easily besets us. And he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. So there's direction, right? It's not just run the race, figure it out, do whatever you want, you'll figure it out along the way. No, we're looking to Jesus. We're doing this for you, God. So I'm going home and I'm apologizing to my wife or to my husband, right? Because I'm doing it as unto you, God. Because I'm looking to you, God. I'm, I'm going to go to work tomorrow. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to tell my boss I'm sorry. I'm going to do my job right. Why? Because I'm going to humble myself. I don't like doing this stuff either. You know how many times I had to tell my bosses? You know what? I was out of line. I was wrong. I was wrong. 
I still think I can do the job better than you, but I'm wrong, forgive me. I'll do what I'm told because I'm in a position of subordinates. Subordinates, right? That's what God told me I need to do. And I'll go and do that, why? Because I'll do it unto Jesus. Because I'm looking unto Jesus. You ever hear the, you know, the old simple illustration? You know, where you look, that's where you're going to go. That's why as much as you try to drive your car straight, you know, if you get, you know, billboards are there for advertising, you get to look quick and glance, it gets fixed in your mind and hopefully you buy their product or whatever it is or go to their whatever it is. But if you start looking too long, you start doing this, right? You just start going. Where you look is where you go. Where you look is where you're headed, Right? What you're glancing at, right, you, you, you can glance at some things here and there, but if you can't stay looking at that thing too long, you're going to start going that way. So if bitterness and resentment fill your life and those are weights that are holding you down, you don't let those things go, your whole life is going to be wrapped up in those things. But look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Look to Jesus Christ, and you know what? That's where you're going to go. You're going to become more like him. As you behold him, you're going to become more like him. Now watch. Look unto Jesus. He's the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look what he says. He said, Jesus had to endure some suffering. Jesus had to endure some pain. Jesus was looking unto something also. He was looking to glorify his Father, and he was looking to have fellowship with you and me forever. That still boggles my mind, by the way. But that's what, he's, that's what he did, right? And he said, look it. And he had to look through, look. Middle of verse 2. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He saw something before him. He was looking to something before him. There was joy set before him. But you know what? There was a cross in the way. But he endured it. He got through it. Why? And he hated the shame. He hated it. You think he wanted to be stripped, naked, beaten, scourged, and all that stuff? No. He endured it because he looked to you. And he saw you. And he saw his father glorified in his death, right? And that's what he saw. He looked before that. He looked through those things. See, and that's what happens in our lives. And the author of the book of Hebrews is saying this. Listen, you, you guys are going through some trials. Some of you are being put out of the synagogue. Some of you are being persecuted. Some of you are being martyred. Look through those things. Just like Jesus looked through the other side of the cross. Even though he hated it, even though he despised the shame, he looked through those things. Can we look through the trial? Can we look through the pain? Can we look through the, you know, the things that we go through? Getting fired from jobs, going through divorces, all those things that we endure sometimes in life. You know, children backslid and falling away from God. All those things. Can we look through those things? To say that God has a plan. And God has a purpose. And God's doing something. And I'm not going to get angry. And I'm not going to get bitter. I'm going to keep on pressing on. Just like the cloud of witnesses did in Hebrews chapter 11. Just like Abraham. Though he fell, he kept pressing on. Right? Just like Moses, though he screwed up, he came back and was used of God mightily. That's the exhortation for us. Can we look through those things? Now watch. Verse 3, he says, just consider him, consider Jesus. See, when we go through the trials, when we go through the struggles, when we go through the persecution, and when we're going through whatever it is we're going through, consider Jesus. Consider him. What did he do? That endured, he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, what does that mean? Contradiction of sinners. People hated him. Some sinners loved him. Some sinners hated him. Some sinners handed him over to be crucified. And the ones that crucified tortured him and loved doing it. Some of them cheered as he was being crucified. Some of them mocked. Contradiction of sinners. They were all sinners, but there was contradiction going on. There were things going on. 
He goes, consider Jesus. He went through the same thing. Listen, when you got saved, when I get saved, when I got saved, hopefully I don't have to get saved. Hopefully I'm already saved. I shouldn't be doing this. But when I got saved, you know what? Instantly, there was contradiction of sinners in my life. I go home, Mom, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm saved. I'm, I'm going to heaven. Let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's, that's good for you. It's good because you're a troubled kid anyway. You, know, get, you need a little Jesus in your life. I don't need no Jesus, but you need Jesus, right? And then you think other people are going to get saved and you start telling them and then, and then there's conflict in your family. There's people that are dividing from you, husbands from wives and wives from husbands and children and everything else and all the contradiction that's going on in your life. It happens to you. It happens to me. It happened to Jesus. He came to save the world. He came to die for sin. But you know what? At one point he said, I haven't, I haven't come to bring peace but a sword. What did he mean by that? Because sometimes, you know what? Mother's going to be set against daughter. Daughter against mother. Husband against wife. Sometimes a man's enemies will be those of his own household. There's a contradiction that goes on. And it's painful sometimes. It's not easy. Some of you come to church every week. You have unsaved loved ones that won't come with you. So you know, keep that stuff to yourself. Keep that Jesus stuff to yourself. Some of you have you know, husbands or wives or children that are saved that don't want anything to do with Jesus and you're trying to live for Jesus and you're a contradiction in their life and it drives them crazy because they want to live this sinful way for a little while longer. But keep living for Jesus. Keep living for Jesus. Don't let those weights hold you down. That's what he's saying here. Jesus went through it. We need to go through it. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against it. He goes, many of you weren't martyred. Some may be. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, he's quoting from the Old Testament, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. Okay. Now this is difficult. What he's saying here, in some way, shape, or form, is he's saying to this early Hebrew church, some of the battles and the persecutions that they were going through was a result of God's chastening because they weren't going full on for Jesus Christ. Interesting. Because they weren't going full on for Jesus Christ. Some of them, not all of them. All right? Remember, there's a mixed crowd there. Some were saved living for Jesus. Some were saved on the fence of wanting to go back. And some weren't in the camp. Right? And this is what he says. He goes, don't you remember what the Old Testament says? Don't despise the chasing of the Lord. It's like it says, don't despise it and don't faint. Because that's what happens when the chastening of the Lord happens to us. Sometimes we despise and we get angry at God. And sometimes we want to give up. We get angry and we want to give up. And sometimes, you know what, we, we play like, I'm not angry at you, God, but I'll get angry at other people. I get angry at other Christians. Well, if you're angry and you hate God's people, then you're angry at him, whether you realize it or not. Right? It's true. And that's what happens when the trials come and the persecutions come, and sometimes he sees it as the chasing of the, of the Lord. He goes, don't despise God through it all, and don't faint. Don't give up. He goes, because you're a son or a daughter of God. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. I can point to things in my life, times in my life. You ever, you ever play the game, Lord, I, you know, I don't know who's messing with me. You know, is it me? Is it my own sin and my own self? Is it the, being tempted of the devil? Or is it, is it you doing this to me, God? You know, we, we go through that. Maybe you don't. I do. I don't know. And I'm like, Lord, is it something in me that I'm doing that I don't see, Lord? Is it, is it, is it the devil, you know, tempting me? Is it, is it you, God? I, I, I don't know what it is, God. What, what's going on here? And, and I do that too. I do the same thing. You ever go through that? I go through that. And I'm wondering, Lord, you know, am I being chastened? Is it something I'm not seeing? Is it something you need me to see? But I can point as I look back in my life to specific instances in my life that I know God's hand was chastening me. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Usually it's this way. Usually you say, God, you know what? I'm going to do things my way, right? And I'll just pray that you bless me in the midst of it. I'm going to do things my way, 
And it'll all work out in the end because I'm your child. It will, that's true, but you're going to be chastened along the way because in whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And I can give direct examples in my life. God says, and usually the chasten comes from, chastening comes from, okay, have it your way. And God says, okay. And then it hurts. You know, with finances, right? None of us battle in that area. You know, finances, I'm like, okay, God, I can't, you know, I got to have this and I got to have this and I want that and I got to have that. And if I have this, then I'll be able to serve you. And if I have that, so there were times in my life in the past that I have all kinds of credit card bills. And then I'm like, Lord, I'm like, what? You know, I'm, your, I'm your child. I want to do more in ministry. You got to pay those bills, God. You got to do this, God. You got this is you. You, you got to, you know. And God says, oh, no, no, no. You got to pay those bills. Because your heart was wrong. See, and God teaches, teaches me something through that. And what he, what he showed me is something from another perspective. That my heart was wrong. My heart was divided. I fell under the chastening hand of God from my own stupidity. God said, okay, now you're under my chastening hand. Now you have to work it out. And you know what? It was painful. And it, and it hurt. But I made it through. And then I look back and I say, why did I even want to buy those foolish things anyway that my kids just do backflips on and destroy I have no problem grabbing the $50 couch from Craigslist now. Now, that's just me. That's just me. And I learned something. And I learned something through it. And I'm thankful that God taught me to live a simpler life in certain areas. Now, that's just me with finances. What it is with you, I don't know. You could have relatives. I'm not going to forgive them. No way. It's not going to happen. This is what they'll do to me. And God, you know what? You'll fall into the chastening hand of God sometimes. And then you'll realize after you do things God's way that God was right all along because God's trying to develop in you and in me Christ-like character. Christ-like character. That's what he's doing. Now watch. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges. Now scourging hurts. Every son whom he receives. You see that? He's not casting us away. He's, he's scourging us and he's chastening us because he wants to draw us closer, receive us, not push us away. Now listen, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? Now listen, in the Proverbs, it's, it talks about chastening a, rebellious, chastening a rebellious son 13 times. You know, 12 times it's with a, a rod. A rod's basically a beaten pole, okay? <laughs> Go get your switch kind of thing. And that's what he's saying from God. Spiritually speaking, if you endure chastening from God, God's dealing with you as a son. He goes, for what kind of father doesn't discipline their kids? Right? He said, you would be a bad father if you just said, hey, Dad, what do you want, what do you want to do today? I don't know, what do you want to do? I'm not your father, I'm your buddy. You do whatever you want. Figure it out. See, that's how I grew up. I grew up with no dad, right? No dad. Kind of just like, go do whatever you want. And I found myself getting chastened from people at school, in the principal's office, missing out on things, everything else. I find myself missing out and getting hurt in a lot of ways because I had no one to tell me, no, you can't do that. And you can't do that because I'm trying to protect you because I love you. He says, what kind of father would we be if we didn't chasten our kids? If we didn't teach them right from wrong and if we didn't correct them with the rod sometimes, if need be, what kind of father would we be? And he's saying in the same way, what kind of father would God be if he didn't chasten us, if he didn't correct us? But... If you be without cha chastisement, listen to this now, you love the old King James here. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards, meaning you're fatherless, you're not sons. Meaning if God's not chastening you, then you're not his. Then you're not his child. You know what this tells me? That every single one of us are going to be chastened from God at one time or another. Every single one of us. You, ever, you, know, you know, some of us learn the hard way. Some of us learn the hard way right? Every single one of us are going to have to learn the hard way at one time or another. 
God's gonna chasten us and he only chastens us because we are his own, because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't chasten us. If he didn't love us, now when I say chastening, it's not like a big you know, switch comes out of heaven and whacks us on the backside. You know what I'm saying. Spiritually speaking, providentially, he orchestrates things in our lives to teach us lessons. I just gave you one from my own life. You know what, but the, Bible, you know what the Bible says, though? If you judge yourself, you would not be judged of God. And you won't be chastened of God. Meaning if you know the sin that's easily besetting you and holding you down and you know what it is, envy, wrath, bitterness, resentment, whatever it is. If you know it and you go to God and repent of it and say, God, you know what? This is my sin. I'm sorry, God. I don't want to do this anymore. Forgive me. Give me the grace to, to, to put, leave this stuff behind and walk in newness of life. Give me that grace. If you go to God and say that and you really mean it and you start to walk and take steps of repentance, then God won't chasten you. That's what it says. What kind of father would I be if my son stopped doing the things he was doing, right? And I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a just-in-case whack, all right? Just in case you do this, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I, on credit, I'll give you some credit whacks, right? So, I, you know, I, I'll give you some in advance, so when you do do it, I won't have to do it to you <laughs> again. Does that make sense? What kind of father is that? And I'm trying to think of the times I've actually done that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but you get the point. You get the picture. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. But when he chastens us, it's for a reason. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh. Some of us had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? See what he says? He says, we have, we've had fathers. Some of us have had fathers, and they've chastened us, they've corrected us, okay? And they did it for their own good. They did it for their own good. And by the way, you're not a child forever. You're a child till you're maybe 16, 17, maybe 18. Some of you are 35, you think you're still children, but you're not. You, hopefully you shouldn't be. Hopefully you've grown up. You put away childish things the way Paul said, but you grow up. But the God the Father is the Father of spirits. That's why in heaven, we're all God's children forever. There's no more sons. I, uh, I'm not going to have any more sons and daughters in heaven. Neither are you. Neither am I. But there's only going to be one Father of spirits. See what he says? There's only one Father of spirits. And he goes, how much more should we be subject, subject to the Father of spirits? Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to be subject to the Father of spirits? Now, listen. When someone's correcting us, when our earthly fathers correct us, they're correcting us because they want us to be subject and to listen and to do things their way, right? Listen, obey, do things their way. And sometimes it might not have been the best when you were kids. Sometimes they thought they were giving you the best or doing the best, and sometimes they weren't. But the point is, even earthly fathers want you to be subject and do things their way. How much more should we want to be subject to our heavenly father and do things his way? See, for me, as I grow in the Lord and as I grow to love Jesus more, I want to obey more. I don't want to obey less. For me, when I realize how much God loves me and that Jesus died for me and Jesus paid it all for me, how can I not want to obey more, not less, right? Hopefully when my, when my children get older and they've gone through all the chastening and all the correction and all the training and everything else and they despise it and they want to faint sometimes, just like you did when you were little, hopefully they'll come to a place of maturity. They'll look back and they'll say, hey, you know what? My dad loved me loved me. That's why he did this for me. That's how God wants us to see him. That's how God wants us to look at him. God's only doing this because he loves me. God's only allowing this because he loves me. He wants what's best for me. Now listen. Now when I was a kid, even though I didn't have a father, there was a, I had a mother's boyfriend for a little while. When I was about 10 to 16 or so, when I was around and then I, I was out of the house when I was 17 but I used to get beat beat like a guy sometimes all right 
And I look back, you know what, I'm st- when I look back to my heavenly father, and I look through all that, and when I got older in my 20s, I wanted to go and get him and all that stuff, because now I was bigger than him and all that. But now that I look back, I look to my heavenly father, and I'm actually thankful that that guy was there for those years. You say, how can that be? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because I needed someone to fear. Because I was a rebellious kid. And the one thing that he did is he, he, because I I was afraid of him, even though it wasn't the best fear. You're supposed to have fear your parents a little bit, but fear them because you know they love you. But I look on the the silver lining in this is when I look back, I know God is in control because you know what I would have did to my mother during those years? I would have totally run roughshod over her. And at least I feared somebody. Though he didn't love me, I feared. And God taught me something through that. Because you know what the Bible says? That God is a father to the fatherless. That God was in control of all of that. That God knew exactly what was going on. And even before he died, I thanked him for those years that he was there. I did. I used to get beat with other things too from my mother, but I really wasn't afraid. Salt shakers off the head, like the, the, those big, what are those big salt shakers put on the table? The people that this, they're like this giant. Why can't you just get a little salt shaker? I got one off the head one time, but I laughed. But when he came at me, I was afraid. But I look back and I know that God used it for good in my life. Now, look what he says. Verse 10. For they verily for a few days chastened us. He goes, our earthly fathers, for a few days they chastened us after their own pleasure for what they thought was best for us. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Will you see what he says here? When God chastens us, when, we, when, we're, when we're feeling the chastening hand of God, it's not for evil, it's for our profit. It's to benefit us. See what God has for us? Listen, God's not against us. If you, if you haven't realized this yet, God's not against you. You don't have to fight against God. God's for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus is for you. And you feel like, well, God, why are things so hard? Why are things so difficult? Oh, I can't pay my bills sometimes. And why does my whole family hate me? Oh, and I just don't fit in sometimes at that church and everything. Else. Why is this happening to me? Why, 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 why? Why? God's for you. He's not against you. God loves you. It's to your profit. God wants to bless you. And how does he want to bless you? That we might be partakers of his holiness. Holiness. You see that? What does that mean? God wants to make us more like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the Holy One. So when we're chastened, it's only because God wants to make us more holy and more like Jesus. It's to our profit. It's not to hurt us. And you know, sometimes we can't see it. So I'm like, well, Lord, you know what? I, I lost my job. I lost a child. I lost my family. I lost this. I'm losing this. Why, why is this going on, God? This just isn't right. This just isn't fair. Why, God? Why? Why? It's because God wants to make you more like Jesus Christ. See, if you read the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, Matthew chapter 5, right? Blessed means happy. Blessed, the face of God shining upon you. It doesn't say blessed are you if everyone gets along with you. It doesn't say blessed are you if you have everything. It doesn't say blessed are you if you have the best job and position of power in the world. But you know what Jesus is basically saying? He's saying happy and blessed are the holy. The more you become like Jesus Christ, the more holy you are, the more blessed and happy you are. That's to your profit. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants to make me more like Jesus Christ. And that's painful sometimes. Let's just see if we can get through a little more, then we'll close. Now, no chastening, verse 11, for the present seems to be joyous, obviously. When you get the spanking, it's not a happy time, but it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, listen, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You see what he says? He goes, when it's all said and done, when you look back at your life, 
the story I just told you, when I look back at my life, I know that God has a purpose and God has a plan and the Father loves me. And he wants to make me like his beloved son. There's a purpose. There's a plan. I see what he's doing. I can look back. Now, when you're going through it, he goes, it's not fun. It's grievous. It's painful. It's not easy. And it's real. I tell this to people all the time. Listen, the Christian life isn't just, hey, I believe this and I believe that. Hey, everything's great. The Christian life is real. Real. You know what that means? That Jesus really lives inside you in the person of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit really is working out something for the glory of Jesus Christ in your life. That the Holy Spirit really is conforming your character and my character into the image of Jesus Christ. That's real. That's why when Paul prayed for the Philippian church, he said, I pray that your belief, that your Christianity would be without wax and it would be sincere. That you would be real, genuine Christians because the Christian life is real and it's powerful. A few more. Now here's the exhortation. He goes, it's hard when we're being chastised. It's difficult, but God has a purpose. A lot of these early church members were being chastised. And then he says this, wherefore, lift up your hands which hang down in the feeble knees. He goes, you guys are depressed. You guys are down. You guys feel like you're up. Now get up, he says. Make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Now what's he talking about? And this is where we'll close. And you can read ahead for next week. He's saying this. If you don't look at things from God's perspective, if you don't look at life and sometimes the chastening of the Lord from from God's perspective, if you don't see it that way, you're going to walk around a depressed, miserable Christian. And that's why he says, lift up your hands, get off your knees, get going for the Lord because God has a plan, God has a purpose, follow peace, walk in holiness. That's what he's telling us to do today. And then he says this, look diligently, verse 15, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, what does it mean to fail of the grace of God? What does that mean? That doesn't mean, hey, you know what? I don't have the grace of God anymore, so I'm going to lose my salvation. The grace of God is gone. No, what he's saying is this. You'll fail of the grace of God if you don't walk in the grace of God. Very simple. The grace of God is always being poured out upon you. Kind of like this. You got your shower running, Right? Do you stand outside your shower? Hopefully you don't do this. And try not to get visuals, but I'm giving you an example. Do you stand outside your shower with a bar of soap and try to wash up? You'd be a fool, right? You got to get under the water, right? You got to get under the fountain. He's saying the grace of God is always pouring out in your life. But if you don't walk in that grace... If you don't let the chastening of God do his work, in, do its work in your life, then you're going you're gonna to end up with a root of bitterness that springs up and troubles you, and you, you're defiled. You know what's always good, you know what is always great about the Lord Jesus Christ? What's always great about our God? It's, it's, it's this. For me, it's unbelievable. That it's never tomorrow. It's never next year. It's always right now with God. His mercies are new every morning, Lamentations tells us, right? Read the book of Lamentations. It was, it was a painful time, painful for the children of Israel, but his mercies are still new every morning. You know what that means? You can get right back in and walk in the grace of God right away. You can go to God right now and confess and say, God, you know what? I have been bitter. I have been angry. I have been lazy. I, I haven't been trusting you with, with funds and finances or faith or whatever it is. And you get right back under the fountain of God's grace and you're washed clean again by the blood of Jesus Christ.